Hey everybody, it's Tim from Lenosa Farm Specialty and Heirloom Livestock. Thanks for joining me again today. So this is our third uh, live stream in case you haven't been following or you didn't know. Uh, we're going to be doing this every Wednesday. The original thought was I was going to post a video and then I was going to go live and we were going to talk about it um, and just kind of keep everybody up to speed and on track with what we're talking about. But the reality is, is this works out better. There's just too many questions out there um, for us to stick with one subject. So the best way to do this, I feel, is just to kind of open it up. And if you have questions, you can go ahead and ask and I will do my best to answer. Not going to guarantee that I'm always going to have an answer for you, but I'll at least do uh, the best that I can to get you an answer. Um, so we've actually been having some power outages here in the area uh, today. So if for some reason uh, you lose me, I will I will be right back. So uh, for those of you that are on here, if at any time you have any questions about anything that is going on, um, feel free to let us know. You know, we're kind of moving out of lambing and kidding season now. Most of you are probably on the tail end of that. And we're moving into pasture things. We're moving into uh, worming issues. A lot of people are having worming problems this year. Um, you know, we had a really mild winter. We had we had a mild-ish winter. Uh, it's kind of weird last year. So two things happened last year. Um, we had really hot temperatures that quickly became very cold and then we kind of went hot again. And so what ended up happening was a lot of lambing and kidding here in the Northern United States and Canada kind of got behind. So we would normally expect for our natural breeders, if we just let them go and let them breed on their own and do their own thing without any kind of hormonal implants, that they were going to have babies, you know, generally speaking here in Northwest Indiana, we would expect babies yeah, late December, early January this last year, we actually had our our babies uh, February, March, some of them. So that was, that's very, very late for us. Um, you know, when it comes to the heat, uh, that really plays a really plays a number on on moms. Essentially, what will end up happening is they'll just kind of absorb that embryo. So if you uh, if you were to have pregnant animals out on pasture and they're still within that first trimester time period and you get 100 degree weather or something like that what what you're going to see is they don't necessarily abort they just kind of absorb that embryo and um, nothing happens so trying to hit a window to where you're having your ewes or your does have babies in let's say like october time frame something like that you know, you're going to have to breed them in June uh, in order to have October babies. So, you know, that can be uh, that can be a problem. Generally speaking, uh, you'll see a lot of your uh, show folks that will do this. They want like fall babies, early fall babies. You know, the honest thing is, is the 4-Hers here in the northern part of the United States and in a lot of places, they're they're on paper. They're saying that their babies or their lambs or their go kids that they're showing are born in January or later. But the reality is, is most of the breeders have those babies on the ground um, no later than November. So that's just for them to get a leg up. Yeah, we haven't really done a lot of videos. Show stuff really isn't my, um, I wouldn't say it's not my thing. Uh, you know, we, we show and, and we know quite a bit about showing, but we don't really discuss uh, show stuff too much on our uh channel that that's kind of a that's a dangerous that's a dangerous place to go um it can get a little it can get a little tricky and it's very easy to make people very upset and to kind of to tell you some of the things that go on out there for those of you that have very traditional farms and and do you know your breeding and everything very traditionally it would just it would absolutely blow your mind i think if in indiana alone if you google it if you go back, and I can't remember if it was 2012, I want to say it was sometime between 2008 and 2012, um, every, every, every single lamb um, that placed in the finals in the grand drive at the Indiana State Fair was disqualified uh, for illegal drug use. Every single one. If you, uh, there is an article out there that I'm sure it's still online that you can see. Um, so, you know, that, that tells you, 
you know, what's going on in the, in the show industry, uh, in general, um, you know, the, the steroids that are given to some of these animals, the off-label feeds that are given to these animals, um, diuretics. So things that, you know, people would take for like congestive heart failure, things like that, uh, Lasix, uh, things like that. They're, they, these are all common things that they give to these animals. The other thing that you really got to watch when you're dealing with uh, club lambs or club goats and we that's the term we use for these animals that are raised specifically for show is like a club lamb or a club goat um you really really gotta be careful when you're purchasing them if you're purchasing them for general breeding stock on your farm don't get me wrong these are fantastic looking animals um but i think it brings up a, a valuable point that if you're going to bring an animal onto your farm um it's important to know what were the feeding habits? What were the warming habits? What were these things? Uh, how did this animal live on the prior owner's farm in order to look the way that they look? So, you know, if you go to these farms, and we see this happen all the time, people go to farms um, and they look at the lambs and they say, oh my God, these lambs look fantastic or these goats look fantastic and I want to bring them to my farm. Um but you want to do things completely different than the way that they were done on the farm that they came from. So for instance, you know, you go to a farm and you find a, a lamb or a goat kid that you really like, and they've been feeding it grain, like free choice grain. Uh, they've been warming it often with chemical warmers, so on and so forth. And uh, now you want to bring them home and throw them out on pasture and you want to make this a pasture sheep or a pasture goat and they just fall apart. And we see this happen all the time and they just fall apart they get worms they fall apart you know the all the weight falls off of them and people are like man what the heck happened well you know that's not the the way that that animal was raised that's not the way that that breed uh was taken care of on that farm and you know you just you can't change it up that hard you can ease animals into things. I'm not saying that you can't take an animal that was maybe raised for show and, and get it acclimated to pasture and get things going to where they work well. Um, I'm just saying that it's, it's a slow, easy process that you that you have to uh, keep in mind when you're, when you're bringing new animals to your farm. The other thing that I would say is... Um, you know, when it comes to feeding, uh, if you can, when you get an animal uh, from a dealer or from another farm, if you can bring a little bit of the, if they're eating grain, if you can bring a little of that home with you and kind of mix that in, um, that can be helpful uh, so you don't get scours. You know, if you switch them up really hard from one to the other, it tends to open them up. Um, a little bit more heavily for upset stomach and scours. Uh, TJ asks, do you still grow buckwheat to feed as hay? Um, we do. Um, we, we had really good luck with the buckwheat. We've grown buckwheat. Uh, we grow buckwheat for a few different reasons. We grow buckwheat for, um, uh, for our honeybees. And, and then uh, we do make hay out of it. You got to watch buckwheat um, because it does have a, it does have an effect on their photosensitivity of the skin of sheep and goats and actually of horses and cattle and all kinds of things. So when you're feeding buckwheat, um, you really, really have to watch if you're feeding straight buckwheat because what will happen is they become extremely prone to uh, sunburn and it will just the it will just scorch them um so buckwheat is a warm season crop um it's think of it as teff grass and, and as far as when you would plant teff grass uh i believe the soil temperature has to be 80 degrees or higher in order for don't quote me on that it's either 80 or 85 degrees or higher in order for it to um, properly germinate it grows really really fast it flowers out really really fast it goes to seed really fast and then it dies. It doesn't come back too well after it's been cut. If you let it go to seed first and then cut it, you'll have a better chance of it coming back. But once the frost hits it, it's done. So uh, a lot of farmers will use it as a cover crop. It's relatively inexpensive. Um, to be honest with you, I think if I were going to overseed a pasture with something, let's say I had a weak stand of of grass or alfalfa or something that was looking kind of puny and i wanted to put something in there that was going to really beef up 
my uh, cutting for like second or third cutting, I think I would consider tough grass. Um, it's like all grass and almost no stem. It's very, very fine grass. It's from Ethiopia. Uh, the price of it can get a little bit high and you got to get somebody that knows what they're doing when they're drilling it for you. It actually has to be drilled in and it's drilled in very, very shallow. Uh, but it's extremely drought tolerant. It grows great. And that's tough grass, T-E-F-F -F, uh, grass. So another thing to consider, although buckwheat's great. If you have, if you have honeybees, especially, and you want to do something different, I'm not a huge fan of the honey. It's really, really dark and it smells like an old sock, uh, but, but some people seem to love it. So, you know, great, great question, TJ. Thanks. Uh, all right. Joaquin Fierro, are you still using oh what are you using instead of penicillin yeah so a great question um there is a massive shortage of a couple of medications out there right now so the big shortages that we're seeing right now are penicillin and uh spectinomycin so the spectam it's a red liquid that you give for scours you just can't find that and then uh, as far as the penicillin is, is concerned, you can't find that either. You know, there's very few things that we we use penicillin for on the farm. Um, generally, we use it when we get newborns uh, to help prevent navel ill. Uh, mastitis is another kind of go-to that uh, we would use penicillin for. I know a lot of the vets do have it. If they don't have penicillin, they do have some uh, some suitable subs that they can probably get to you. You know, generally speaking, if you've got just general crud on the farm, uh, LA two hundred or the generic LA two hundred, the um, seventy eight two hundred or whatever it's called, it, it's it's tetracycline. You know, LA two hundred is tetracycline. LA three hundred is tetracycline. It's just how many milligrams per milliliter. So. You know, the LA-200 is 200 milligrams per milliliter. LA-300 is 300 milligrams per milliliter, but it's all the same. It's a tetracycline-based broad-spectrum antibiotic. Um, you know, I don't know I don't know if we're ever going to see penicillin on the shelves again, to be quite honest with you. In 2023, uh, over-the-counter antibiotics are going to go away. You won't be able to get them anymore. You'll have to have a veterinarian actually uh, prescribe that for you. So, you know, there's this downshift between antibiotics. They're all going to have to be relabeled. Um, so I would suspect we're going to see a lull uh, for a short period of time where it's, it's going to be hard to get your hands on. I know the veterinarians that I know still have penicillin on hand and they're still able to get it um, in certain geographical locations. But overall, a lot of people are, are switching over to uh, just use an LA 200 to be honest with you, you know, LA 200 works good. And then you get into the prescriptives that you can get from your veterinarian that work really well, uh, as well. And so then you're looking at like Draxon, um, and, uh, my mind is, it's slipping my mind right now, but there's another, there's another, uh, broad spectrum antibiotic that we like to use, uh, as well. So, I would say if I had a sick animal and I needed to treat him right now, I would probably go get uh, the duramycin or the LA-200, the tetracycline-based stuff. That's probably going to be the best if you want over-the-counter. Um, if you want to go to your vet, then you know go there, and then you got all kinds of other options. But yeah, great question. I think I think penicillin's done. I don't. I just. I honestly don't think as consumers over-the-counter, we're going to see it come back. Um, but that's my personal opinion. I, I may be wrong, but I guess time will tell. All right, Dustin. Hello, Dustin. Um, so Dustin was talking to me about textiles. Um, textiles, a lot of you probably aren't, aren't too awfully familiar with textiles. You know, if our video that we put out yesterday, I was talking about all the different breeds we have on our farm. And man, we have a ton of different breeds on our farm. Um, and Textil is just one of those animals that we never really got got into. There's just not a lot of people that raise them in our area. Um, they are little meat wagons. Um, I've been told they're really, really good. They're just god awful to look at in the face. They're a little on the they're a little on the homely side. Um, 
but uh, you know, if you're looking for body condition, overall body condition to add to your flock, um, boy, they're they're really hard to beat. And I know overseas, man, they are hot, hot, hot. You look at some of the markets in Europe and what some of these tech souls are going for, and they are, uh, whew, they are something else. So, yeah, Dustin, I did. I got a call out to our sheer um, Colin Sigmund. Uh, Colin runs Yankee Clippers out of Vermont. He and his uh, girlfriend Siri, and I know they raise Texels. Uh, they, uh, I think they're just now start. I haven't heard back from them yet. I think they're just now kind of wrapping up their spring shearing. They actually start in Vermont, go all the way down the East Coast, I think, to Pennsylvania, and then they go all the way over to the Mississippi River. Uh, we have quite a large uh, turnout for our shearing here on our farm a couple times a year. They come out, and then uh, we go from we go from there. So, yeah, Dustin says, you know, he's he's concerned about the non-Texels giving birth to Texel lambs. And, and that's a great question. That's something that I want you guys to consider. And we've talked about this in some of our other videos. So Dustin, I'm glad you brought that up because that gives us a good topic to talk about. And that is um, you really, really, really got to watch the front shoulders on your rams or on your bucks. Um, you know, you'll go to a farm and you'll look at a ram or a buck if you're looking for a new prospect and you'll be like, man, look at that one. He is massive. Um, and the problem that you are going to run into, we really like our, our, uh, rams and our bucks to have a nice V shape to them. And the reason for that is, is nobody wants to be out there pulling babies. You know, if you're going to get hung up, uh, if those babies are going to get hung up, they're going to get hung up on their front shoulders. And I, that's what Justin's talking about. You know, he, he, he really likes these Texels cause they just have superior muscling. But then we run into the issue of, well, if I get a Texel buck, or uh, excuse me, a ram, and I breed that on another species or another breed. Um, is am I going to be pulling babies all year? You know, ain't, ain't nobody got time for that. Uh, and so you really got to watch that. In the in the, um, I guess in the business, you know, we'll look at a we'll look at a ram or a or a buck, and we'll say, man, that that dude's really blown apart. You know, is a term that we'll use. We we say. Uh, you know, if me and another guy are talking and we're looking at some, we're looking at some animals, we'll be like, oh man, that, that dude's really blown apart. And what we mean is, is that the shoulders are just really, really wide. The chest floor is really, really deep. Uh, and while when they're little, that looks appealing and you'll look at them and be like, oh man, they're going to be huge. Uh, they just continue to blow apart as they get older and those shoulders just keep getting wider and wider and wider and the chest floor gets deeper and deeper and then what you end up having is you start having all these babies that are getting stuck and that you're having to pull and that is just atrocious and time consuming and you lose money because if you're not out there to pull every baby i've been there i had a season a couple of years ago uh where i goofed up and got a little greedy and i kid you not almost every goat that i was born on my farm that year. I had to pull, uh, and I mean pull. So yeah, you gotta be really cautious about that. So yeah, Dustin, I didn't forget about you, buddy. Um, I'll get some more information on you. So, so let's say, let's say that, uh, I do get the word from someone and they say, Oh, well, yeah, you know, you're going to have issues. The best way around that is, is, you know, you can select maybe a smaller, uh, a smaller ram or smaller buck of this, of the breed that you like, for easy lambing or kidding. And the other thing you can do is maybe breed, uh, get a larger breed you and a smaller breed, uh, and a smaller breed, uh, male, uh, you can, or, you know, a larger doe and a smaller male, you can go that route as well. So yeah, that's, that's kind of the way we try to do things here. I had, uh, we got, uh, we picked up some Dorpers from West Texas this year and they are just massive animals as well. Um, and looking at them and looking at the size and the things that I'm seeing with them, like there is no way I would breed a ram off of that breed into like any of my smaller frame breeds, like a Dorset or a South Down. Like there's just no way. Like there's no way I would, it would destroy that you try or uh, that you trying to deliver that baby. And I just don't feel like pulling. So 
Um, TJ says, would you not sell goats to farmers that want to pasture raise if you're feeding hay plus supplemental grain? No. So great question. No, I think, you know, ultimately it, you just, you be transparent with your customers and you tell them just say, Hey, this is what I got. Um, and this is the way that I'm feeding them. And, and that's up to them. I mean, if they, uh, if they want what you have and they're, they're happy with it, you know, as long as you're transparent with that customer and you tell them like, you know, this is what we're feeding. Sometimes, sometimes customers won't even ask you, like they'll come out and they'll just say, they'll just say, yep, that's what I want. And, you know, I, that's why that's the difference between the people that educate themselves and the people that don't at all of you, you know, if you're going to buy an animal and you can, ideally, I want you to go to that farm and I want you to ask questions, you know, like, okay, what are you feeding this animal? How much are they getting? If they are getting grain, how much are they getting? Um, you know, all of those are valuable questions, but I mean, you can't within reason, you can't be everyone's babysitter. I mean, you guys, you're taking the initiative to learn about, about sheep and goats, or at least maybe get some supplemental information. I mean, there's probably topics with sheep and goats that some of you know more about it than I do. You know, this is just one more avenue for you to glean a little information. You, you, um, you know, you, you, you talk to me, you take what information I have and you spin it around your head and say, well, some of this works for me and some of this doesn't. And you keep the good and you spit out the rest. Um, but you know, some people aren't interested. Uh, and so while we do our best to educate our customers, you know, within reason, uh, it's kind of, it's kind of up to them. So, um, there is danger in that though, TJ. And I think I understand where you're coming from. Like you don't want to sell something to someone. Uh, you have to be cautious. Like, you know, let's say I try to be cautious about my customers and I have the, I have the ability to be able to do that. Um, where some people don't, I can be a little bit more picky with my customers than some people. Um, but I'm, I usually won't sell to someone that just has no clue about anything whatsoever and doesn't want to learn, uh, about anything because the problem is, is if they, and I think this is kind of going to TJ's point probably is if, if I sell an animal to someone and it completely falls apart because they don't raise it correctly, um, and somebody goes to their farm or, and they look at it, they're like, where did you get that thing? Um, you know, or I don't want the customer calling me up in a month and saying, you know, this animal went to hell in a handbasket. What happened? Well, you know, that can, it, it depends on how much time you want to, you want to invest in that. But again, just to round out the answer to that question, I think, yeah, you know, you just, you just be as honest as you can with people, tell them how you're raising them, tell them how you're doing things and, and you let the cards fall where they may. Gabrielle, uh, Barber's pull worm already had two losses, went to the vet. He recommended a combination of Dectamax at the 1% solution give orally, which is the first time I've heard that, and Valbazin. Yeah, so that is, I've been hearing about that lately. Dectamax given orally. We've had quite a few, we've had quite a few customers that have said that um, over the past, uh, over the past maybe year. Um, and I don't know what the deal is with that. So it is, Dectamax is manufactured and designed to be given as an intramuscular injection. I know a lot of customers will tell a veterinarian, they'll be like, I don't feel comfortable giving an injection. Um, and so the veterinarian will be like, well, you can give it orally. It is effective orally. You know, th there are wormers that are given off label. So for instance, a lot of the show folks for years gave pour on Cydectin uh, for cattle as an oral drench to sheep and goats. It'll just nuke anything that's in them. Uh, it'll, it'll destroy them and, and you'll end up with awful resistance and all kinds of other problems, but you know, people do it. So I don't know enough to argue with your veterinarian on that one. I can tell you that, you know, when it comes to routes of administration with any medications, and this is people medications or animal medications, you always get a more precise dose when it's injected as opposed to giving it orally. Um, and some medications aren't as 
active when they bypass uh, or when they go through stomach acid and things like that. So I, I don't know. Um, so yeah, I don't have any, I don't have an answer for you there. All I can tell you is the Ductimax is designed to be injected. Um, and Valbazin, uh, Valbazin is okay. Um, I like Valbazin cause it's a little bit more gentle and it also works against tapeworms. Um, but I mean, try it, I guess, see if it works. Um, you know, we talk a lot about, we talk a lot about, um, worm resistance. We talk a lot about warming shock. You know, all of these are things that you have to keep in mind as well. If you get a really, really sick animal that's got bottle jaw and got issues like that, you know, you always want to be cautious when you're warming them because chances are they're going to get a lot, lot sicker after you warm them and then they'll slowly start to recover. And we have a video on that where we talk about the warming shock and kind of the science behind that. If you haven't checked that out, kind of do a search for that and check that out. Um, but hopefully that kind of answers your question. As much as I like to say I have all the answers, I do not. I've never, ever given uh, Dectamax orally. And so my gut reaction is, is they're telling people to do that um, because the people don't feel comfortable giving a shot. Um, but yeah, I don't know. So, ooh, a Texel Suffolk cross. Oh, good Lord. I bet that is a monster animal. I can <laughs> I cannot even imagine. So, yeah, Dustin, keep us posted on that one. I would love to see a picture of a Texel Suffolk cross. Um, that is that is wild. You know, we've even seen that in goats before. I've seen um I've got a I had a buck on my property that was like a Nubian cross with a something it was something weird it was like a nubian cross with a nigerian dwarf <laughs> and you would think like really and uh it ended up being to where this thing was just built like a tank um you know it had that that long lanky body style so it grew tall and it grew long but then it had that frumpy stockiness of like a nigerian and uh yeah this the dude was just built like a meat wagon so that's the beauty of breeding some of these breeds together is it's really cool you're getting you're getting together you're getting what's called a hybrid vigor uh, so you've got these genetics that haven't been together for a long long time and then you've got this other kind of like sideshow science experiment that you're doing like you never know what you're going to end up with so really cool yeah keep us posted on that conrad hello conrad nice to see you again how do you control fleas on babies before you vaccinate yeah fleas mites lice all of that um we talked about this a little bit last week we've got so so we kind of put this out on the web uh, and talked about it a little bit and it seems like the people that know uh, we came to a consensus of three porons that we all like um and those were ultra boss clean up two and then silence now, I am only going to speak of silence, uh, and that's spelled C-Y-L-E-N-C-E. -E. I'll put it in here, C-Y-L-E-N-C-E. -E. Uh, if I, maybe I'm not typing here. Let me put it in there for you. C-Y-L-E-N-C-E -E is how you spell that. And that is, silence is a poron uh, insecticide that goes along their spine. I, I think of it as like you would apply medication to an animal that, to like your dog when you do flea and tick medicine you know how you start on the back of the neck and kind of go to the tail um that's how we apply our silence now if it's an adult we will apply silence so what we do is we put silence into a syringe and so don't you know don't get syringe and needle confused syringe is the plastic part the needle is the part that the, obviously the needle that goes on it so i'm just going to take an empty 10 milliliter plastic syringe and i'm going to suck up silence and then fill it up and then what i do is i put the tip of that syringe so it's up against their skin and i start to apply it from the back of the neck to the tip of the tail and so it really gets good skin contact so any adult I go 10 milliliters. If it's any any baby, like you know, pre-weaning or just weaned, and they're still pretty small, I'll do about five milliliters. And that really seems to work great for lice, mites, uh, and fleas. If we get mange, I still apply that, but I'll also give them an injection of Dectomax. And the reason for that is, is while the um, fleas and the ticks and the uh, uh, 
lice and things like that tend to be kind of on the surface and they suck blood. The mange actually burrows underneath the skin. And so the thought process is, is when we treat them with the silence, it's going to get them from the surface, but the Dectamax also gets into the blood. And so when they're sucking the blood, uh, they're going to get poisoned and killed then as well. But I think if I just had fleas, yeah, for sure, I would just use, I personally would use silence. But again, I have heard good things about Ultra Boss and Clean Up 2. I think Clean Up 2 is a bare product as well as silence. And then I don't know who makes Ultra Boss. Um, but Ultra Boss is like a permethrin medication plus something else as well. So hopefully uh, that answered. Um, uh, hopefully that answered your question as well. All right. So uh, again, you know the mange. You'll know they'll start getting kind of like crusty, uh, crusty nasties. Uh, sometimes you'll see it around around their eyes. Um, and other places like that. So uh, something to uh, keep in mind, especially around the goats, you'll start to see it like around the eyes. They'll get real crusty, like dermatitis, nasty looking stuff. So, all right, uh, Jake. Hi, Jake. Do you breed your ewe lambs before they are a year old? Yeah, great question. Somebody just asked me this the other day. Or is it better to wait and breed them after they are a year old? I raise pulled dorset sheep. Awesome. So pulled dorset sheep, um, pulled dorset, great mother inability. They're just a great all around sheep. I, for those of you that if, you, if you're watching this today and you haven't made a decision about sheep yet, um, I think pulled dorset is a great breed to start with. Uh, and I'll throw that out there. I'm a huge fan of them. Uh, and if you have the luxury of getting them from Jeff Hunter, uh, Hunter dorsets in Indiana, I would go that route as well. So what I'll tell you is what Jeff Hunter tells me and Jeff Hunter, uh, and this is the way that we do things as well. If our, we strive to get our use up to, uh, 75% of, of their mature body weight before we breed them. So I just had, uh, I just had a conversation with my friend Scott about this the other day. He said, well, are you breeding these, your replacement use this fall or your replacement does this fall? Or are you going to wait? And my answer to that is, well, it depends on how they're raised. So I don't put my replacement use and my replacement does out on pasture with the rest of my adults the first year. And when I say replacement, what I mean is, is these are female babies that I intend to use as breeders later on, you know, down the road. They're going to be the new moms on my farm. Um, they're going to replace someone. Someone's getting cold and these ones are stepping in. And so what we do is we keep them on dry lot that first year and we still uh, feed them grain. Uh, they get a one pound per head per day of 12% protein or higher, uh, usually closer to 16 or 17%. And then they're getting a minimum of one flake per head per day of good quality hay. Um, and that is because we want to push them to get to, you know, 75% of their mature body weight by the time of breeding. So we will breed uh, our does and our ewes that year. This year may be different. And the reason is, is normally uh, my babies are born in January. This year, my babies weren't born until February or March. So it's really going to depend. Um, I would say if those moms, you know, a pulled dorset you, a traditional pulled dorset you that is actually pulled dorset, um, I would expect a mature body weight of a, approximately 150 pounds, somewhere between 135 and 150 pounds. If they're crossed up with another breed like an Ile de France or a Columbia, you can get something bigger. So again, just kind of get a, a ballpark idea and aim for that 75%. If they can meet that mark, go ahead and breed them. If they can't, then you may want to hold them over. My point is this, you want to breed them as early as possible. You know, the whole point of having these animals, if you're running a, a commercial operation is obviously you want them to have babies and to make you money as soon as possible. They're not making you any money when they're sitting there eating food. Of course, you know, with that being said, you're trying to be responsible and you don't want to kill them either. And, and I appreciate that. So, uh, you know, you're just going to play it by ear. The other thing to consider is this. Hey, if you can't breed them until January, then meh, breed them in January. You know, there's nothing that says that you have to breed them at that traditional breeding time in the fall. Um, you know, if you got to hold them over for a few more months, then hold them over for a few more months and, and see how things go. 
so uh how do you deal with poop on tails when on pasture i rotate every two days so it depends uh, you know fly strike is a huge issue that we worry about with animals so you want to make sure that you're always watching out we don't want to leave poop on tails the, the whole point of docking the tails of the sheep is to prevent fly strike traditionally that's what it was done for was to prevent fly strike so what fly strike is is fly strike is when you get poop on the tails and the flies will come and lay maggots in that poop and the maggots basically eat the animal alive uh, if you have never seen this before it is extremely unsettling um, please check that out um, and see uh, see it online do a search for fly strike and you'll see it and you'll understand if we see a lot of loose uh, stool generally it will correct itself usually we see loose stools for a few reasons uh, parasite load uh, so we're talking worms coccidia something of that nature a change in feed uh, or generalized stress so Either they're getting too hot, they just got moved, and the feed quality is much, much richer or much, much different than what they were used to, or they're suffering from some kind of uh, they're suffering from some kind of parasitic or gastrointestinal issue. So in that case, you know, you want to give them the once over, check them out, make sure that they, at least for all intents and purposes, as far as you can tell, they don't have a uh, parasite load, and then. Uh, if it is coming from the recent change to pasture, then it may just be something that will eventually resolve on its own. With that being said, you still need to be careful and you, you can't leave your animals out there on pasture. If they've got poop cake to their backside, you're going to have to do something to clean that off um, because you're really, really putting them at increased risk for fly strike. You know, I understand that some of you don't necessarily like docking tails on your sheep, and I completely get that. Um, but it's important that you do if you have wool sheep again we're not doing it and you know you don't have to dock it super duper close but you have to dock it close enough that you're not going to get poop in that wool and get fly strike so hopefully that answers your question so if you got them clean them up as far as rotating every two days i don't really know if that really has much to do with it i you know rotate as often as you need to if you that really stinks that you got to rotate every two days um but if you have to do it you have to do it i know you know some people have lots of land some people have a little bit of land and you're just going to find out what works for you um so yeah that hopefully that answered your question uh cheryl hello cheryl cheryl wants to know are buttercups poisonous to goats i've read both yes and no I don't want to spray the field and kill everything if I don't have to. Um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I would. Ha I'll have to research that one for you and and let you know if if it is or if it isn't. If the goats are eating it, generally sheep and goats are really really good about not eating things that are poisonous to them within a within reason. Uh, there are certain plants that are in the nightshade family that it's very interesting. We have a a plant that will show up in our pastures every once in a blue moon called a detura um oh, is it a detura brugmansia i can't remember there's a family of plants that are one is called devil's trumpet one's called angel's trumpet angel's trumpet i believe is brugmansia and the devil's trumpet is detura if i remember correctly regardless it is very very poisonous to them and uh it is amazing they'll just eat all around and they won't eat it it's really hard to know sometimes when you're going online and you're reading about these things because uh you know you can read certain literature that will tell you that uh clover will cause sterility in females this was a big thing like uh years ago where they were saying oh don't let your sheep or goats eat clover uh because it'll it'll make them sterile and they won't they won't get pregnant and completely debunked uh but it was out there and man everybody was talking about it. i mean my animals eat so much clover uh good lord if it made them sterile i would never have any babies uh so it, i try to go to the universities for these questions and if i can if i can i try to get it from them 
if you can't find the answer, then uh, when it comes to nutrition, find an ag department at your local university and send them an email and be like, hey, this is where I'm at. The closer to home that you can email them, the better. So for instance, here, I live right up the road from Purdue University. Um, so the people that, even the people that develop our feed for us on foundation feed are all trained ag people from Purdue. Um, that's where our, our guy got his degree. So my point is this, is if I have a question about a local species, I'll just email Purdue extension and ask them because they're more likely to know if they live in my geographical location, because they probably deal with that. So, you know, if you're in North Dakota, email North Dakota, you, if you're out, out East, you know, maybe Penn state or, you know, fill in the blank and just send them an email. And they're usually more than happy to answer your question. Just say, Hey, I got this. What's the deal? And, and usually they'll, they'll tell you those people are bored. They like to talk to people and answer questions. Uh, so, uh, that's the best I can give you, but I'll, I'll look into that for you and see if I can draw up any information as well. So sorry, I couldn't give you a direct answer. Um, but hopefully I gave you something to think about. Do you have any recommendations on a microscope I could buy to be able to do fecal egg counts? Ooh. Um, I have my own microscope. Um, you nowadays you can buy them. You can buy them relatively cheap. It to do a float uh, properly to prep the slide. That's the hardest part. So the microscopes. I mean, you can get a microscope on Amazon uh, for relatively, you know, inexpensive, maybe a hundred dollars. Uh, but doing doing a proper float uh, specimen, getting on a slide properly and knowing what you're seeing is the learning curve that you're going to get into there. So I don't know if anybody does. I don't know if there's anything on online where they teach you how to do that or not. Gosh, I don't know. That'd be a heck of a video to shoot. I don't even know how that would be a learning curve for me because for the video, I'd almost have to find out how to how to show pictures of what I'm looking at underneath the microscope. And, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. Price it out with your local vet and see how much they're charging you to do a fecal egg count and then determine, you know, your input. And that's, I mean, that's the name of the game with all this stuff, right? Like there's so much stuff that I would love to have for our farm. I would really, really like to have a new, uh, containment system and a sorting system, but, I mean, there's just no way. I mean, I have I have an one that's that's probably older, as old as my grandfather that I use, uh, but it works. And then I look at these prices, and I'm like, let me see, five thousand dollars. How long is it going to take me to recuperate five thousand uh, dollars? And the answer to that is a really, really long time. Um, and you know, it's the same thing with a microscope. If you look at your time and you look at the microscope, and you come to the conclusion that like, nah. Yeah, there's no way. Um, but perhaps, it, you know, it is something that you want to do. And in that case, go nuts. I'm just saying my point is, you know, crunch the numbers before you make any of these big purchases and and go from there. Uh, you know, don't fall too far into the trap of, well, I'm just going to claim it on my taxes. and I'm going to get the money back. You're not really going to get the money back. You're going to be able to depreciate some of this stuff. Uh, but, you know, still, it's a lot of money. Uh, for some of these some of these toys that are out there, and if you can get by without them, then get by without them. Especially with the economy and everything going the way that it's going now, like I'm not making any big purchases this year. I'm not trying to like panic or freak out or anything, but I'm not doing any big purchases this year. Everything's sky high, uh, all the materials sky high. We've looked at putting up a new barn, and there's no way. I think we looked at putting up a barn a couple of years ago, and it was going to run us like 58,000, uh, for the barn that I wanted to put up. And I priced it out a few weeks ago again, just for poops and giggles. And I think it was 115,000 for the exact same thing. So it's, it's a crazy, it's a crazy world out there, um, uh, for sure. And a lot of us are, are kind of leery. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where all the prices go. You know, on one hand, we have a lot of individuals that are coming to us and saying, I'm really thinking about getting into, cheaper goats because the prices are really high yeah the, you know the the sale barn prices are really high they're walking at a high price and we're making good money off of them but the reality is is when you look at what the inputs cost um it's kind of a wash or we're losing a little bit of money as compared to where we were a few years ago 
you know, the price of grain is going up, the price of gas to get them to market is going up, and the price of breeding stock is going up. Uh, we've kind of jumped since 2014. Uh, back in 2014, I would say the average, a really good registered breeding you, I could get you into one through most breeders for somewhere in the ballpark of between $275 and $300 a head. Then we kind of worked our way up slowly but surely, and now we're at 400 450 a head for a breeding ewe. Um, so it's been interesting to see how the prices have changed. You know, has that kept up with inflation and gas prices and everything else? Nah, I don't. I don't really think so. So it's a it's a strange time uh, to be in the business. It's a, it's a strange time just to be here in general. So um, I hope all of you are learning. And again, we talked about this in our video last night. You know, and and no kidding, and I really do mean this, and it's really the the driving force behind everything that we do on this channel is I really think that if you can learn how to do your own vet work within reason, there's always going to be a time where you're like, nope, call the vet. But the simple stuff that you can do, the warming, the basic wounds, the baby delivery, you know, this, that, and the other, those basic simple things. Um, if you can learn to do that yourself, you are going to save so much money, like so much money. Um, you know, boy, it doesn't take long, uh, to, to take an animal into the vet. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you, we had a, we had a doe this spring that was a very good doe and it was an extremely complicated birth. I knew she was going to have to have a C-section. Um, and I just wasn't up for it. So I took her to the vet and I think, you know, it ended up costing me about $500 to have the C-section done. The baby was dead and the mom died the next day. So, you know, it's hard to recoup that money and that stings really, really bad, especially for those of you that are getting started and maybe you only have two or three breeding females, does or ewes. And man, you know, if you lose one, that hurts really, really bad. So learning how to do this vet work on your own, and it's not beyond any of you. Like, you know, you're going to fumble through some of the stuff when you first start, but at the end of the day, like none of this is beyond, you know, the mental ability of any of you. Every single one of you on here can very easily learn uh, how to do most of these things without a doubt. Um, Baker's on a few acres. Hello. Uh, West central Missouri. Could you please explain the best practices that are crucial for bringing new animals onto our farm? We need to add some does. So ideally you, you're going to want to quarantine them when they get onto your farm. Ideally, you're going to want to go to the farm that they came from and you're going to want to ask, you know, questions and get answers as far as what do they have on their farm? Have these animals been tested for any kind of communicable diseases? Are they carrying anything like hoof rot? Um, things like that. So, you know, when I go to pick up a new animal, I really, really want to give it the once over as much as I can. Um, you know, you want to check the mouth. You want to check the bite. You want to check the eyes, especially, you know, don't ever, ever buy and bring home a sick animal to your farm. Just fight the urge. Even if it's the best deal you've ever had in your life, just don't do it. Um, and you know, when you bring them home, you're going to want to quarantine them. There are some tricks that you can look for in an animal when you're actually on the farm, giving them the once over. So the thing I do is I start at the head and I work my way all the way down to the feet. Um, I check the eyelids obviously for pallor. I check the mouth to make sure the bite is correct. I check the teeth to see if the teeth are broken and I check the teeth so I can tell how old the animal is and is the animal as old as they are telling me it is and vice versa, you know, aging that animal, make sure that they're not. If I, if I am looking at an animal and I catch the seller in a lie about one thing, I just assume that everything that they're telling me is a lie. So if I look at an animal's mouth and the breeder says it's a yearling and it's two years old, um, then we're just done. Um, if I catch them trying to sell me an animal that's off in the mouth, and when I say that, I mean, it's parrot mouth or scissor mouth or something's wrong with the bite, then we're just done. Um, if I catch them trying to sell me something and I feel the bag, um, and there's an abscess or a granulum or something in there, then we're just done. 
because if, I mean, let's be honest, if somebody's going to lie to you about one thing, uh, they're going to lie to you about other things. So I started the head and I worked my way back, check the eyes, check the, um, check the mouth, um, feel along all along the neck, all along all the lymph nodes, so which would be kind of in the armpit area and the, uh, kind of the uh, back leg hip area and i'm feeling for any kind of lumps or abscesses to see if this animal has anything like cl anything like that you'll sometimes feel abscesses um, and then i want to feel the bag like really feel and palpate that the bag of that animal and feel if you feel any lumps or hard spots that could be indicative that the animal's got an abscess or had some issue with mastitis or something in the past and then obviously you want to check the teat structure you know we talk about it's okay to have extra teats uh but you want to watch out for like fish teats and things like that um it's going to cause issues to where they may not have good milk production or that lamb or that goat kid is going to want to latch on to a non-functioning teat and then you're going to have issues there as well so after i give them the once over and last but not least i go to the feet um, and not only do you want to look for overgrown feet, that might be an issue, but if you see feet that are extremely hard, like they are just, the hoof just looks like it's hard as rocks, or it has kind of like a calcified or a white powdery look to it, that means more than likely that animal may have suffered from hoof rot in the past, and they've been treated with some kind of uh, zinc mixture or even a... Um, oh shoot, there's another, there's another mixture that's basically formaldehyde, formalin, um, and they will just make the hooves hard as a rock. Um, and if you see that, and it's hard to identify if you haven't seen it before, but once you see it, uh, you'll know and you'll be like, ooh, this animal's had hoof rot. So now not only do you get a new sheep or a new goat, but you also get to bring hoof rot back to your farm. Um, so yeah, then when you do bring them home, quarantine, 14 days, they go in their own pen and you feed them and you water them and you watch them grow. And I always vaccinate them again when I bring them home. I always vaccinate them again for CDT because it's not worth, it's not worth it. If, if, you know, the individual told you that they vaccinated, them, but they actually didn't. And then they end up getting tetanus or dying or get clostridium and die. It's like such a waste for the 75 cent shot that you're going to have to give them. Um, and so that's something that you want to consider. The other thing when it comes to general immunity, we, there is what's called naive immunity. And that's just when you think of the word naive, like, oh, you don't know, right? Well, you get this uh, naive immunity from some animals that have been in a really closed flock or maybe out on range for a long time. We have some ewes that we've brought into our farm from places like Montana where they've been out on range their entire life and they have no immunity whatsoever to things like uh, some of the abort abortive uh, bacterias that are out there. So if we're bringing an animal that comes from a closed flock into our flock, we will generally vaccinate them against uh, all the abortion vaccines. We give them uh, the abortion preventative vaccines and then CD and T. And, and that's, and then at the end of the day, you're just rolling the dice. Uh, we've, we've been burned before uh, and hopefully you don't get burned, but that's the best you can do is try to find somebody that seems to be honest and trustworthy, um, establish a rapport with someone and then hope that they're shooting you straight. And then when you do, uh, find someone that you can deal with and that's reliable, uh, you know, you thank God and then you just keep dealing with them and hopefully they stay in the business. Because uh, once you find somebody that's good, boy, that's a, that's an amazing thing. Um, so hopefully that that was a very long winded answer to your question, wasn't it? But hopefully, hopefully that made sense. Conrad, hi Conrad. Um, what prices are you paying now for breeding doe and a buck? And do you have Nubians in your flock? So we have uh, we used to have more Nubians than we do now. We have a few Nubian crosses. Um, but as far as like full-blooded Nubians, we do not, um, we have a friend, uh, up the road that has full Nubians, uh, and we're familiar with them. We've had them before, but no, we do not, uh, have Nubians right now. What prices are you paying for breeding doe and buck? So that is a great question. Um, and it depends on a little bit on your geographical location, but if I had to say like, just 
across the board if i were to get like a really good breeding a very sound breeding doe i would expect to pay somewhere and i'm talking like a kid like a doe a doling that has not bred yet that was very good i would expect to pay somewhere between 350 and 400 dollars possibly more if it was like something really special um and then as far as your males are concerned um i think 600 dollars is a good is a good place to start not to say that you can't get them cheaper and sometimes you can find a deal and sometimes you can find something that you know they're gonna they're gonna get rid of them for a cheaper price um but if i'm going to reputable breeders where no kidding i know what i'm gonna get that's that's kind of where i'm at right now and that's kind of where we're at with sheep as well now i've heard i see crazy prices all the time um i i was just watching an auction a couple of weeks ago where they were selling uh weathers castrated males for show for the fair uh for ten thousand dollars a piece um which made me think maybe i'm in the wrong line of business <laughs> but you know if people are willing to pay it they're willing to pay it uh, but the breed standard is right now, it seems like most people are in about the $400 range for a good female and 600 and up uh, for males. So we're within about five minutes of, of wrapping it up. If anybody else has any questions that they want to ask, uh, if not, I think we're getting ready to wrap it up. So I see we've got quite a few people. Hey, we put out a video last night um, that was kind of a... Uh, I don't want to say it was necessarily a behind the scenes look at our farm here, uh, but I brought up a lot of things that you probably don't really realize that we do here on our farm. We have a lot of stuff going on here on the farm um, and a lot of little side hustles that help us keep the farm afloat. Uh, everything from our livestock guardian dogs to our honeybees um, to the way that we fertilize our fields and everything. So if you haven't checked that out, uh, um, be sure to check that out. We actually just posted that last night. And then, of course, during the week, if you guys have questions, feel free to jump on Lanosa Farms Tack Box um, and uh, check that out as well. And you can ask any questions on there that you want to ask. So, Conrad, what abortion vaccines do you recommend? I am going to go to my, I have my actual book right here and I can tell you exactly what I give. Um, so the two abortion vaccines that I give, I give uh, chlamydia, uh, killed chlamydia vaccination. Um, so you vaccinate use 30 days before breeding and then use that have never been vaccinated before we'll get a second vaccination for the first year. It's a two milliliter subcutaneous injection over the ribs. Uh, and it looks like it runs me $1.35 per shot. Um, is what I pay for that. The other one that I uh, vaccinated against is for uh, vibriosis. Uh, and you give that uh, same thing 30 days before breeding. And that's a five milliliter sub Q shot given over the rib cage. Uh, and that looks like it's running me about 82 cents a shot. So just to kind of just kind of put that out there for you. So you're going to see it online. I'll type it in here for you. If you're going to go and buy it somewhere, uh, Vibrio is what you're going to see it dash Campylobacter factor and, uh, chlamydia. Those are the two that you're going to see, um, that you would want to vaccinate your use, uh, or doze with if they're going to be prone to abortion. So just something for you, uh, something for you to consider. All right. So Dustin, Hey Dustin, you're still here. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> one female lamb born this year has a pelican mouth. Obviously she goes, but would you call the U too? Or is it just some freak thing that happens? Mm, that's, that's a personality question <laughs> more than anything. You know, anytime I see like one thing pop up, unless it's something like, like super wild, uh, I would, I just chalk it up to a, a genetic mutation that caused the problem. If the mom is correct in the mouth and the dad is correct in the mouth, and then you have a baby that's off in the mouth for whatever, then I would just say, 
I'd say, ah, I'd let it slide. Next year, if you have an issue again, then I would let them go. You know, it's if you told me that you had multiple babies that had this issue, then I'd be like, oh man, it's probably in it's probably in your mail, obviously. Um, but you know, yeah, if it's one female, that that's not the end of the world. And that's why we tend to be so aggressive about picking our uh, males. Cause you know, that male, whether it's a buck or a ram, that thing's going to be 50% of the genetics in your flock. So if you want to get the most bang for your buck, like that male's where it's at. As far as the females are concerned, you got a little bit more wiggle room for error as long as you think your farm can handle it. Um, and as long as that baby's still able to eat and grow, um, I think you're good to go. Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. Dextamax is a uh, per manufacturer directions is an intramuscular shot. Uh, one milliliter per 110 pounds of body weight, I believe is what the, what the bottle says. We give our Dextamax, uh, we just round it out to one milliliter per hundred pounds. And then I actually go a little on the heavy side. Don't tell anybody, uh, but I go a little bit on the heavy side. So if I get an animal that's up to, a, you know, if I get an animal that's, let's say like 135 pounds, I'm probably going to give them two milliliters. Um, and so far so good. I haven't had any issues there, but all right, guys. Well, this works out really well. It's kind of like the same group of us every week and that's great. Um, I just enjoy doing this. You know, we have about 20, 25 people on here at a time. It looked like we peaked out at, um, and that's perfectly fine with me. Uh, so again, every Wednesday at 8 p.m., if you have any questions, ask on the tack box. If not, just save your questions for next week when we're all here again together, uh, and we will go from there. So thanks for joining us again, guys. I look forward to talking to you again next week. And if you have any friends or anyone that you think could benefit from what you know the information that we're putting out, uh, by all means, make sure you invite them. You guys are the reason that we're successful. I recognize every single one of you, uh, which is really cool. I haven't met. Uh, I don't think I've met any of you. But the cool thing is, is I've talked to a lot of you uh, and I feel like I know you. Uh, so maybe one of these days we'll uh, see some of you guys at one of our annual open houses. But anyways, you know what I'm going to say. So uh, I'm Tim from Lanessa Farm Specialty and Heirloom Livestock. Thanks for joining us again today. And I look forward to seeing all of you again next time. Thank you.